we got blessings on blessings. We got blessings on blessings. Yeah, we got blessings on blessings. Yeah, 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 yeah. Blessings on blessings. Yeah, yeah. Blessings on blessings. Yeah, blessings on blessings. Yeah. Shalom, Mishpaka, and what a time to be alive! What a time to be alive! I want to begin this study by reminding us that Moshe has completed an additional 40 days and 40 nights on the mount with Yahuwah. And if we remember in the previous study, we saw Moshe come down the mount and it is recorded that his face shone, so much so that the people were afraid to approach Moshe. And we talked about the esteem of Yahuwah and that Moshe's face shining is the physical reminder of that esteem to the people. And this occurred because of Moshe's request and him being exposed to it as a result. And it was made possible by Moshe being in right standing with Yahuwah. If that were not so, then it is plausible that Moshe would be no more. Now, I want to take a second and expound a bit on this concept of being in right standing, being exposed to the esteem of Yahuwah, and it being a dangerous proposition if you are not in right standing with Yahuwah. I've mentioned in several lessons about being called and chosen, and additionally, those chosen being tried and their reward for being tried and found faithful. Let's look at Hebrews 12, 28 through 29. And it says, wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve Elohim acceptably with reverence and righteous fear. For our Elohim is a consuming fire. Now, this set of verses begins by stating we receiving a kingdom. And we know from Messiah that those who will inherit the kingdom are those that follow his example by doing the will of the Father. It is a process. Hence the word, receiving. So the beginning statement, we, it is not all inclusive. It is speaking to a select group, those who have been called and chosen. Remember, Yahushua said, no man can come to me except the Father which have sent me draw him. Also notice that what they are in the process of receiving is a kingdom which cannot be moved. The kingdom is the stationary component, not the select group. They can be moved from receiving the kingdom if they do not complete the process properly. Next, it says, let us have grace. All right. The text here, it should read, let us find or abide in his favor. That number nine that you see next to it, it's telling us that the meaning here is to hold fast or to remain. And in order to hold fast, you must first obtain or find that favor. Now, we all know that grace is the Hebrew word hen, and it means to separate the seed. In layman's terms, that means to set apart the seed. And it is speaking to the fact of how one becomes called and chosen. The Father draws him. He has found favor. But remember, he must hold fast because he can still be moved. This is because there is an additional component to this favor or grace. Let's look at Hebrews 4. 16, it says, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of favor that we may obtain mercy 
and find favor to help in time of need. This throne of favor or grace is the Father's throne, the one who has drawn you. Here is where you find the missing component, mercy. And again, mercy in Hebrew is hased, and it means kindness, favor, and as we've as I've mentioned before, it also means piety. So this ability to be and remain pious is what you need to be able to abide in grace or favor. So if we go back to Hebrews 12, having found favor, esteem, or grace through our piousness enables us to serve Elohim acceptably with reverence and righteous fear. Why? for our Elohim is a consuming fire. But fear not, 1 Peter 1, 3, it says, blessed be the Elohim and father of our master, Yahushua HaMashiach, which according to his abundant mercy have begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Yahushua HaMashiach from the dead. That is our hope. To an inheritance, this inheritance is that kingdom which cannot be moved. And here we find it's also incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away. Reserved in Shamayim for you who are kept by the power of Elohim through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now we know that in the last time, that's when our trial by fire will occur. So this faith that we see here has something else attached to it. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and esteem at the appearing of Yahushua HaMashiach. So we see that that faith and that thing attached to it is going to be tried with fire. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 3, 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Yahushua HaMashiach. Now this verse is actually the key to a statement found in Matthew. Matthew 16, which Bakad Yahu hit last week, 13 through 19, it says, when Yahushua came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say that thou art Yehuchanan, the immerser, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Shimon Kepha answered, and said, thou art Mashiach, the son of the living Elohim. And Yahushua answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Shimon bar Yona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my father, which is in Shamayim. And I say also unto thee that thou art Kepha, and upon this rock I will build my assembly and the gates of Sheol shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom again, of Shamayim, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in Shamayim, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in Shamayim. Now, although Kepha's name translates to rock, petros, 
from which we get the name of the location with the rock edifice, Petra, Kepha is not the rock being spoken of. What he utters is the rock and the foundation of our faith. It is the belief that Yahusha is Hamashiach and the son of the living Elohim. This is the foundation that we should be building upon. John 6, 40, it says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. 1 Corinthians 3, let's pick up at 12. It says, Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be redeemed or saved, yet so as by fire. Remember, Elohim is a consuming fire. Do you know that various times throughout the scripture, um, those that are considered precious to the Most High are described as gold, silver, and precious stones? I find it interesting that in verse 12, these three things are mentioned alongside another three things, wood, hay, and stubble, the latter representing things that are able to be burned easily. You do know that you and I are the works of another. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 3, same chapter, 5 through 10. It says, who then is Shaul or you? And who is Apollos or I? But ministers by whom ye believe, even as the master gave to every man. You have planted or I have planted. I have watered or Apollos watered, but Elohim gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but Elohim giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with Elohim, that laborers we are workers together with Elohim. Ye, or we, are Elohim's husbandry. That word husbandry there means tillage, or we are the work of Elohim. Ye are Elohim's building. According to the favor of Elohim, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon whether he build thereupon with gold, silver, precious stones, or he build there with wood, hay, or stubble. 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of Elohim, and that the Ruach of Elohim dwelleth in you? So this temple this building, this work is you, your body. If any man defile the temple of Elohim, him shall Elohim destroy. For the temple of Elohim is Kodesh, which temple ye are. Those that we bring into this walk, they are our works, amongst other things. 
We will all be tried by fire. The only way to receive the promised kingdom is to ensure that your faith, that is your belief and the evidence of your belief, i.e. works, are built upon a solid foundation. That rock of salvation that Kepha was talking about. As it pertains to what I stated initially about Moshe being in right standing, remember Exodus 33, 21, it says, and Yahuwah said, behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, that foundation, and it shall come to pass while my esteem passeth by that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. This week, we are going to begin in Exodus 35. Now, much of the information that we're going to find in this and the following chapters is information that I have covered in previous Exodus studies. It is mainly the application of the instructions relayed to Moshe during his time on the Mount. I will, however, like to highlight some points as we go through them, noting that the Most High initially wanted to give these instructions to Yasharal directly when he first descended upon the mount and spoke to them in Exodus 19. At that time, they were unable to receive them due to the unjust fear they had of the Most High. Yasharal was again slated to receive these instructions via Moshe, when he came down the mountain in Exodus 32. At that time, they were unable to receive them due to the sin they had committed amongst themselves and against the Most High. Hopefully everyone caught that. Because not only is that two witnesses against the children of Yasharel, but it also shows us that unjust fear or improper reverence of the Most High can possibly lead to sin. Let us read the first three verses of chapter 35. It says, And Moshe gathered all the congregation of the children of Yasharal together and said unto them, These are the words which Yahuwah hath commanded that ye should do them. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you a Kodesh day, a Sabbath of rest to Yahuwah. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. I like the way that the Shabbat is explained here. It tells us that the seventh day is a holiday. Well, technically a holy day to you or for you. You see, the Shabbat was made for us and not us for it. It is a Shabbat Shabbaton, a Sabbath of rest. I have heard a few people say that the term Shabbat Shabbaton is reserved only for special Shabbats, like atonement. But we can see from the wording here that this is not true, as it is just basically means a Sabbath day of rest that follows six days of work. So this is technically a weekly recurring Kodesh day and not an annual one, as some may suggest. Now, verse three tells us that on the Sabbath day, ye shall kindle no fire. Many of us have varying degrees of application of this instruction, especially given modern technology. But kindle here, it means to bring forth, to arouse, inspire, or to start a fire. Now, I have personally been in and around the area in which Yasharel is now camped. And I can tell you that there are some times when it can get extremely cold. 
especially in the evening and through the night. So I personally, reading the text, do not see any prohibition against keeping a fire going during the Shabbat. I could be wrong. But then again, that is kind of the point. To honor the Shabbat, there is a preparation that is required of us to be done on the day or days preceding the Sabbath. Let's look at Exodus 16, 23 to 25. It says, and he said unto them, this is what Yahuwah have said. Tomorrow is the Shabbaton or rest of the Kodesh Shabbat unto Yahuwah. Bake that which ye will bake today and seethe that ye will seethe and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. Now, Moshe here is inst has instructed Yasharel to bake and boil on the preparation day and keep it to be eaten on the Shabbat. I see this as a clear representation that we should not cook at all on the Sabbath. Let's also look at numbers. 15, we're going to do 32 to 36. It says, and while the children of Yasharal were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they, they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moshe and Aharon and unto all the congregation. And they put him in ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. And Yahuwah said unto Moshe, the man shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones. And he died as Yahuwah commanded Moshe. Here is a man is found gathering sticks on the Shabbat day or the Sabbath day and he is sentenced to death. On the surface, this is indeed an offense and a transgression of the law. But do you know what the gathering together of sticks is called? A Kodesh convocation. Many of our ancestors have been put to death for attempting to gather together sticks. But here, the clarity can be found in the Hebrew word used here for gather. It is kashaw, and it means to forage for straw, stubble, or wood, which tells us his intent was to kindle a fire. But if you think about it, remember straw, stubble, and wood were also representative of people in 1 Corinthians. I'm just saying. Let's hop back over to Exodus 35. Now, Moshe goes on to speak unto the congregation of Yasharel, instructing them to bring unto Yahuwah the things that have been commanded for the free will offering the gold the silver precious stones linen oil spices etc all things that will be needed for the construction and operation of the wilderness tabernacle and in verses 20 through 21 we read and all the congregation of the children of yasharel departed from the presence of moshe and they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone whom his ruach made willing. And they brought Yahuwah's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all his service, and for all, and for the Kodesh garments. Now, as promised in Exodus 31, we find that 
Yahuwah has placed the Ruach of Elohim in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and in all manner of workmanship into Betzael, the son of Yuri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Yehuda. And Betzael is to teach Aholiab, the son of Akisamech of the tribe of Dan, and both he and Aholiab are to teach the workmen in all things that have been received and need to be crafted for the construction of the tabernacle and its vessels. Let's jump over to Exodus 36. Now, in Exodus 36, Betsael and Aholiab receive all of the offerings from Moshe. And verse 3 tells us that the children of Yasharel brought these offerings to Moshe every morning. The work of construct constructing the items that Yahuwah has ordained has begun. And we get some important information in verses 4 through 7. <clears throat> It says, and all the wise men that wrought all the work of the sanctuary came every man from his work, which they made. And they spake unto Moshe saying, the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work, which Yahuwah commanded to make. And Moshe gave commandment and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp saying, let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing for the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work to make it and too much. Hallelujah. In a previous lesson, I pointed out that all of the items necessary for the tabernacle, its adornments, all of the vessels, curtains, garments, etc., are items that Yasharel received at the hands of the Mitzri as they were departing. Reparations, if you would. I mentioned at that time that many today, in expectation of the second exodus, are awaiting and anticipating reparations that Yahuwah said Abraham's seed would receive after he judges the nation whom they have served. I want to remind everyone again that everything that we receive, we receive because of the favor of Yahuwah. And I feel like a lot of people are expecting reparations to store up treasure for themselves. If we take into consideration the account we have of this initial exodus, we can see that the reparations that Yashara received ended up being required of them by Yahuwah to further the work necessary for the nation. Remember in Exodus 32, the people used some of the gold they obtained from Mitzrayim to fashion themselves a molten calf, and they were killed because of their sin. I point this out because in the verses we just read, we can see that Yahuwah does not forget nor forsake his people. He ensured that what they received in the form of reparations was sufficient to do the work necessary with much left over for his people. All that was required was that they obey the word of Yahuwah. Now, the people, they continue their work with the crafting of the curtains with the cherubims, the curtains of goat's hairs, and the covering of skins, the boards with their sockets, and the bars for adornment and carrying of the tabernacle, the veil and the hanging for the door. And Exodus 37, they craft the ark and the mercy seat with the, with the cherubims, the table of shoe bread with its vessels, the menorah or candlestick with its lamps and instruments, 
the altar of incense and all of its vessels. Also the anointing oil, the sweet incense, the altar of burnt offering, the laver of brass, the court and its hangings. Hallelujah. Now, as I, as I mentioned earlier, the tabernacle, the ark, the tables, the altars, and all of their, their vessels, I have covered extensively in previous lessons beginning with life in a box. In those lessons, I go over the deeper meaning of all of these items. All of this information Yahuwah gave to Moshe as an instruction when he was initially on the mount, what you're seeing here in these chapters is a repeat of that information and the application um, of it here. Now, the remainder of chapter 38, it covers the sum of some of the items that were, <laughs> that were used in the construction of the tabernacle. Moshe had given a commandment for these things to be counted, and we find that Ithamar, the son of Aharon, was given the responsibility of counting these items as instructed. And in verse 24, we are told that the gold used for the Kodesh place was 29 talents, 730 shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary. You know, information and disinformation is sometimes difficult to reconcile. We live in a world where the majority of times, disinformation is the most prevalent information we receive, which in the minds of many becomes their truth. Because the majority of people do not study to show themselves approved, they are ill-informed and ill-equipped to recognize truth when they see it. It probably would not surprise you to know that the majority of the world does not believe that the exodus of Egypt happened at all. If this is the case, then why do we find things like this? Now, this is being used in accordance with fair use and for educational purposes only. These are many articles that you can find that talks about the Egyptian government's attempt to file a lawsuit against the nation of Yasharel, or the nation of Israel, for property that was stolen during the exodus from Egypt. In these articles, they estimate that during the exodus, Israel took 300 tons of gold. I want you to remember that, that number. A talent that we find here is a measurement of weight. One talent is equivalent to approximately 100 pounds. The shekel is much more of a minute calculation compared to a talent, but just know that 730 shekels is roughly around 20 pounds. If you do the math, you will find that the gold that was used for the Kodesh place was around 2,920 pounds of gold, roughly around a ton and a half. Remember, they estimate that Yasharel or Israel took, or Yasharel took 300 tons. What you're seeing here, what they use for the Kodesh place is about a ton and a half, which 
by Egypt's calculation would leave 298.5 tons remaining. By today's prices and standards of gold being right around $2,300 per ounce, this would place the value of the gold used in the Kodesh place alone at $107,456,000. What was left over of the gold, which was probably used for a couple other things, but mostly distributed throughout the people, according to Egypt's calculation, would be worth $21,969,600,000. Dollars. That's just the gold alone. The silver that was used was roughly around 10,045 pounds for the Kodesh place and is equivalent to being worth $4,299 in today's market. Now, I won't bore you with the remaining calculations. I just wanted to show you how much gold and silver was involved and give a monetary value to it. Just to throw one more out there for you, I saw a calculation years ago that estimated that every person that can trace their lineage back to show that they are a descendant of, the, of a slave that was taken during the transatlantic slave trade is owed around $43 million per person. I wanna switch gears for a moment before I close. I have received so many texts, questions, calls, and inquiries from people concerned about the upcoming eclipse. And every time I receive one of these, there is one word that keeps popping up in my mind. Fear. I mentioned earlier what unjust fear caused Yasharel to do next. They sinned against the Most High. Luke 21. 25 through 26, it says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's heart failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of Shamayim shall be shaken. The fear that most are experiencing is because they are getting their information or disinformation from Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, etc. But what did you go there to see or to find? A reed shaken in the wind? All of these things are of and are tools of the world. I've even heard some say that the eclipse is a sign that civil war is coming. Well, praise y'all. Spending your time on these worldly platforms and listening to what they have to say does not replace you spending time in the scriptures and allowing the Ruach to guide you in these things. If you think about it, most people do this because they believe that they are receiving wisdom or knowledge. Some believe that the more they obtain will aid them in reaching their families and others. But what you are receiving is wisdom and knowledge of the world. And that wisdom will by no means save you or your families. Yahuwah has called us to be a light unto the world. Yahusha equates that light or equated that light to a city set on a hill. Set on a hill 
is the key. A lot of times we believe that we have to force our light on others, our friends and families. This is not how it works. Those that the Father has called will see your light and be attracted to it. Those that love darkness, well, your light will repel them. This could be friends and family members. You have to understand and be at peace with that. Now, I've heard people mentioning the fear of three days of darkness, which seems to always pop up around Pesach. For one, that is a Catholic doctrine. And also, do you not remember that when Egypt experienced three days of darkness that Yasharel had light in all their dwellings? I've heard people mentioning that cell phone service is going to be out. Well, the last time I checked, my cell phone typically still worked when it was dark. You ever think that the disinformation that you are hearing is actually a coordinated plan? Last eclipse, my cell phone worked. I'm just saying. People fearing civil unrest, but we and our ancestors have lived in a state of civil unrest for well over 400 years. Is this fear driving you to attempt to preserve your life? Because you will lose it. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For Elohim have not given us a ruach of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I've mentioned this before. And additionally, Brett for Zion mentioned it on Wednesday night. These assemblies that we have on sixth day and on Shabbat, the upcoming feasts are not the time where you should be skipping out. These are appointed times and possibly one of the ways that Yahuwah may use to preserve his assembly. Elohim is our strength and our redeemer. You know, I've never had Instagram or Twitter, right? But we've been all over YouTube and Facebook gathering information. And everything that we gathered, like once we sat there and thought about it, it was only knowledge that we were obtaining to go try to force it or, or tell it to other people to make them, to try to bring them into what we understood, right? And what we realized after years of doing this, and, you know, I'm I'm speaking for him, you know, he can chime in or he can agree afterwards. But after we did this for so many years, we realized, like, that's not the way to do it. All, once you And I, I spoke to one of the Akis earlier, a, a little while ago. Once you obtain this truth and you obtain this understanding, all you got to do is be it. You just have to live it. You just have to be that light. And those who want it, those who cherish it, like the Aki was speaking about, they will be attracted to you. And those who don't want it, it will repel them. But when we take this information and we're so concerned with trying to save our families or save this person, our children, or, or, or that person, you become more, think about it as becoming, you're taking that light and you're becoming like a police officer coming up to your car, flashing that light in their eyes. They don't want it and they can't, they can't accept it. All you got to do is live your truth that you know, live it, and Yah will, Yah will draw people to you, and then you can share with them. Uh, great lesson. You said something. Um, I couldn't take no notes because I was prepping, and so, uh, but you said something towards the beginning, and you connected, you connected it with Yah being a consuming fire, but you said something like He's coming to, to test our works or he's coming do you remember what you said exactly i, I know it was a scripture but i can't remember it but it yeah. got me thinking 
I was like, wait, Jah is a com consuming fire. Scripture also says he's a light. So what's the fire that's going to come and consume and and try us and test us? So I was like, Father, is it you? You're coming? And when you come and we're we're going to be, I'm just asking, I'm asking a question. I haven't studied that. So uh, the thought came to my mind. So I just wanted to put it out there. Hopefully you can give me some insight. I haven't studied it in depth, but Yah, the text does say Yah is a consuming fire. What I was trying to what I was trying to show you is that Moshe was exposed to that. Right. So if you know, we read that in in, in First Corinthians, if Yah is a consuming fire in First Corinthians, he was a consuming fire in Exodus as well, and Moshe was on the mount with them, exposed to it. That's why Moshe had to be placed in the rock, right? Because Yah told him, no man can see my face and live, right? It is only the fact that Moshe was on that foundation, placed in the cleft of that foundation, that he could endure even being exposed to the Most High's backside. And what did it do to him? It made his face shine. So yeah, like in the end, if we're going to be face to face and Yah's going to be there, how much more powerful is that than what Moshe experienced? Because Moshe just saw his backside. I totally agree. I just, I'm like, wow, Moshe, he was hidden by the rock. Right. He was hidden in the cleft of the rock. And now, obviously, we know what that rock is. But I'm thinking, wow, right. that's a great Bible study to uh, to another one to look at so uh that's cool you got you got my mind just my mind is just twirling right now so all good. right well mishpaka i am i am excited i am i am looking forward to um pesach i am so 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 ready um but you know i, I do want to say one more thing before i go i said this to aki Gadol earlier but on um, April 8th, what I am going to do is wake up, praise the most high, pray, study, and go about my day. On April 9th, I'm going to wake up, praise the most high, pray, study, and go about my day. If civil unrest breaks out, I could care less. I'm going to wake up, pray, praise the most high, study, ensure I'm prepared to protect my family, and go about my day. Do not let fear consume you. This eclipse is a sign. It is, is it, it is indeed a sign. And what is what it's a sign, what the sign is designed to do is just to, to reinforce inside of you that his word is true and that he is faithful. If you if you're in the cleft of that rock, like we were talking about, there's no need to fear. We know what the end looks like. It is appointed to every man to die. And then judgment. It's not anything to be afraid of. Just make sure that your foundation is sure and you're building on that. We got blessings on blessings. You got blessings on blessings. Yeah. We got blessings on blessings. Yeah. We got blessings on blessings. Yeah. 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 Blessings on blessings. Yeah. Yeah. Blessings on blessings. Yeah. Blessings on blessings, yeah, yeah, yeah